time for corporate America. And the wealthiest 1% of Americans have just begun to pay their fair share. So the face of it, that doesn't sound particularly good for mm -hmm. Wall Street. And I do wonder whether some of this, Alex, is kind of why we're seeing what we're seeing in terms of markets. A, a level of uncertainty. The earnings are really good. Uh, you've got the Fed still being super easy. You've got... I, the, the, the government's going to spend tons of money and it's going to dish it out like it's going out of fashion. But the market's kind of just going sideways. Everybody feels a little bit uncertain. Market implications, we need to talk about this. Bilal Hafiz joining us now, Macro Hive CEO and editor. Bilal, I'm trying to figure out why there is caution out there at the moment. Because a lot of things have stacked up to give equity markets in particular a lot of momentum. But it just feels like that momentum is starting to fade now. Is it? Are people worried about what the administration in Washington is going to be doing to Wall Street? Is it that we've actually priced all the good news in and there, there isn't any more to be had? Just give us your take on why, why there is this kind of sense of caution, this sense of not having a catalyst to take equity markets higher. Yeah, I think those are all very good points. And I, I, would, I would highlight two or three of them. One is I do think a lot of the good news has been priced in. And this goes to the issue of can data continue to accelerate to the upside? So for the past six or seven months, we've had continuously higher numbers coming out of the US, for example. So ISM month on month, March is higher and higher and higher. So currently the ISM is close to its highest level since the early 1980s. And it's hard to see whether we'll continue to see accelerating growth for the next three to six months. Rather, we're more likely to see decelerating growth, but still positive growth. So the second derivative, I think, is something that the market is focusing on. And I think the second thing that's important is that Biden's policy announcement yesterday tells us that after us getting used to um, these very large fiscal stimulus packages, which are essentially checks in mm -hmm. people's uh, pockets, um, we're now starting to see much more balanced uh, budgets where the spending is spread out over you know, five to 10 years. So it's not uh, one shot in one year. And they're balanced by higher taxes as well. So suddenly there's a, re there's, there's a reality check yeah. on the fiscal stimulus. Well, but I have to wonder, Bilal, you say, okay, a lot of the good news is priced in. Is any bad news, though, priced in? Because no doubt we're going to see an earnings hit and a multiple re-rate if we get a corporate tax rate uh, near 30%, for example. Yeah, certainly, I think at the moment, the market isn't really uh, pricing the bad news. So we're in the zone where we're more likely to see consolidation. Now, where you could see bad news is, say, on the US side, you know, if the labor market or labor supply doesn't come back online fast enough, which could then cause um, a blockage in, in, in growth for the, for the economy. So at the moment, if you look at uh, consensus, it's looking for very strong growth um, that we've already seen in Q1, higher growth in Q2 and then growth to slowly sort of peter off somewhat in Q3, Q4. But if instead we see that labor supply isn't coming back on, on um, back into the economy, then that could slow down the economy. So that's one issue. The other issue we're not sure about is the extent of COVID scarring. So mm -hmm. even if you do see a reopened economy, how much has the trauma of the COVID experience uh, impacted uh, consumer or private sector demand overall? That's certainly something we saw after the global financial crisis. So there are some kind of clouds on the horizon and we don't really know uh, how those will sort of pan out. So, so certainly you could start to see risks uh, head towards the downside if some of those clouds start to uh, become a bit uh, darker. This equity cycle has been unbelievably swift and aggressive and the, as you say, the second derivative, the rate of change, really quite spectacular. Where are we in that cycle? What do you do if you're a portfolio manager right now? What do you do if you're an investor? Do you start to lighten up on stocks? Yeah, I mean, my bias would be indeed to lighten up on stocks. You know, I think structurally, I think the environment is still on a medium term basis. I think you'd still want to tilt your portfolio towards equities on a multi-year horizon. But from a tactical perspective, I, for the next three months, I would significantly reduce my risk in equities. We've had a really good run over the last six to 12 months. But uh, if you look at the way markets are responding to good news, whether it's strong tech earnings, strong bank earnings, strong economic data, the price action isn't very constructive. You know, on top of that, if you look at the equity risk premium, so if you compare 
valuations to bond yields, they're looking less attractive than they were six or seven months mm -hmm. ago. So the valuation so, story is, is, is also looking uh, a bit less attractive. Too. So what do you do? Like, do you buy bonds? Do you buy treasuries? Like, what's going to be the answer to that? Yeah, well, I think in this environment, what you would do is you will look, I mean, I think for me, the biggest source of alpha right now would be um, in FX markets. I think there's a weak dollar trend that's emerging. So that's somewhere one, one could allocate. And I think also the other side of this could be, there could be a convergence trade where we've had US growth outperformance versus the rest of the world. And so you could start to see convergence where Europe starts to sort of perform quite well. So there could be trades where you start to look for European yields to start to go up relative to US yields. So, so the types of trades I'm talking to, to you about are kind of FX rates, a bit more sort of tactical, a bit more relative value. And I think those are the types of trades that would work well in an environment where equities are consolidating. A lot of people, and we were talking to Rebecca Patterson in the last hour about this, getting, are getting excited about Europe. That there is the, the, the catch-up trade, or as Alex says, the catch-up trade. Uh, no, I don't say that, place. you say that. <laughs> um, we just hear things differently. Um, <laughs> you talk funny. But but nevertheless, people are getting excited about Europe, but you're painting an environment in which equities are going to go down. There is this kind of belief that actually Europe is going to play catch up or catch up. In, in the kind of environment you're describing over the next few months, does that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think that certainly on the growth side, uh, Europe will play catch up, catch up, however you want to describe it. Um, the question though is how that maps onto asset markets. And I think the challenge for Europe is that when growth is strong in Europe, that doesn't necessarily always mean that equities will do well. I think instead, I think what will happen is the euro will do well, and I think bond yields could start to go up. And the combination of those two typically sees European stocks underperform. So whereas when US growth does really well, it's a very clear story just by US equities. When European growth picks up, you also see a stronger euro, which starts to hurt German exporters, for example. And you also see yields start to go up, and, and that, that starts to hurt European equities as well. So I think you know, you could still believe in this Europe catch up trade, but I yeah. think um, it's not necessarily an equity story. Alex, there so, yeah. is a possibility, there is the possibility, and we're going to get to talk to Marcus Ashworth on radio a little bit later on. He was, he was literally laughing at me on radio when I suggested that maybe the bun got back to zero. We're at negative 19 now. Just maybe. Okay, but for perspective, he laughed at you one time, and the second time he brought it up, he was like, it could happen. So, I mean, he redeemed himself a little bit. Um, <laughs> but true, true story. So I just I can't let you go, Bilal, without asking about what do you do about emerging markets? Because if you take a look at, say, you know, what's happening in South America and India, how do we re-rate for a world where India may not grow 12.5% this year, like the IMF thinks it will? Yeah, I think the EM picture is very challenging. You know, certainly, you know, you have obviously, you know, the, the story in Brazil, uh, India, the COVID sort of situation. But more important than that, I think, is China. And I think what's, what's happening in China is that policymakers there are essentially deleveraging the economy. They're not providing the extra stimulus that we saw after the global financial crisis. Instead, they're relying on US fiscal stimulus. And so I think that will be a big drag for EM as a whole. So I think in the end for EM, the big hope for EM will just be a weak dollar that will see all, mm. all boats rise. Um, so I think EM's in a challenging spot. There are some bright spots here and there. You know, I think uh, Indonesia, maybe in South Africa, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But I think the broader picture is much less clear cut. All right, Bilal, it's always wonderful to catch up with you, Bilal Hafiz of Macro Hive. Thank you very much. And of course, for emerging markets, Guy, here you go. Commodities are really good for some emerging markets. See? Yeah, gold, South Africa. Look at what's happening there. Yeah.